That's all right. I'm here with Greg Wiseman, the creator of Gargoyles, who we're celebrating 30 years. I'm telling my age, so I'm 35, and I would run, run home, like dash home to get to this show at 4 p.m. So did you know that this show is going to be so impactful 30 years later? Uh, no. Um, you know, I, I was 30, so I'm 60 now. Um, there was no way I could have predicted this. But on the other hand, I did know it was something special even at the time. Um, it was the first show I produced, and I definitely remember thinking that it was a unique experience, a unique time, a unique place, and a truly unique group of people working on it. Um, and and I was right about that. That you know, um, I've done a lot of works since. I'm proud of that work. But it, gargoyles for me, that's always going to be my baby. What I liked about it, and I'm a big horror fan too, so I love the aspect of like the gothic side of Gargoyles. Was that intentional, like bringing that gothic kind of grit to Disney and cartoons? Yeah, it was. I don't think we were the first to bring gothic to Disney cartoons. There's this movie Snow White, which you may have heard of. Yes. It's pretty gothic. Um, but, uh, but that was part of what we were doing. We were influenced by everything from... Um, Night on Bald Mountain from Fantasia, um, lots of stuff that had come before from Disney. But also, you know, my background before being at Disney was at DC Comics doing superhero stuff. And so we sort of set out very consciously um, to create a show that um, was sort of a superhero show without any of the trappings of superheroes. No capes, no leotards, but... Um, but it's that bastard genre that superheroes is that combines detective fiction and horror and um, science fiction and fantasy that has comedy and romance and all that stuff. We knew that's what we were doing and so we would lean into all those aspects of the show, including the horror and the gothic. How did you make it work where something like a lot of adult themes, like I, one of my shows, one of the episodes that sticks out to me is the gun violence episode, but it resonated with me as a child. Like I knew very early, like, hey, this stuff is important and I should be learning about this as a kid. You know, I, to this day, I'm almost surprised they let us do it, um, but it seemed right for our show. We had uh, uh, Elisa Maza is this female cop. She lives alone. So when she gets home, she takes her, her holster off and she just hangs it on a coat rack because she has no kids there. What should she, why would she worry about it? And then these gargoyle shows up and it's her friend Broadway and he's not a kid, but to him, guns are this new thing. He's seen them in movies and people get shot and doesn't seem like a big deal. And then, but it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And... So we just thought this felt like a natural choice for us. And um, we had a, a standards and practices executive who worked with us as opposed to trying to stop us from doing things. And you know what we felt was we should be able to do this. And, and Adrian Bello, who was the executive who uh, I haven't seen in years, but she was wonderful. Um, she, we all agreed, including Adrian, that as long as we showed the consequences of this, we should be able to do that. And that included not just the consequences in that episode, but that Elisa couldn't just the next episode be like up and about as if she'd never been shot. You know, that that had to have long-term consequences for all our characters, not just for Elisa, but for everyone. And that made it an episode that mattered, not just in terms of the episode itself, but in terms of the series as a whole. And so I think it was, uh, you know, what's interesting to me is at the time, we got all this good press for it, and then later Disney regimes didn't want to show that episode. Um, and, for example, on Toon Disney, even though we were on at 1 a.m., they wouldn't show that episode for years, and then they would only show it on Halloween. I don't know why that made a difference, but... Um, and then, you know, now it's on Disney Plus as one of the episodes, but there were years when they wouldn't show that episode at all, even though when it aired, we got points from parent groups, we got books uh, that talked about the negative influence of, uh, of violence on kids, still praising that episode in our show. 
And yet there was a period of time when Disney was afraid of that episode. Did you do that in, intentionally, kind of on purpose, to push the boundaries and challenge not only Disney, but maybe culture to say like, hey, these things should be talked about? Yeah, I don't know that that was our mindset. I mean, we just wanted very much to make the show we wanted to see on television. As opposed to guessing at what the audience wanted to see, we made the show we wanted to see and then crossed our fingers and hoped that the audience would agree with us, you know. Um, I, I wasn't working to be controversial for the sake of controversial, but we wanted to tell the kinds of stories we wanted to see. So that one's an example. Um, Gargoyles was a show with, um, I think, tremendous diversity, certainly for 1990, but honestly, even for now. Um, and, uh, and I'm proud of that. And that was something that I wanted uh, to make a, wanted to do in part because I was bored of seeing a bunch of white people on television. Even though I'm a, a, a white guy, I was like, I've seen that, I don't need to see that again. Um, and so we you know, made an effort to show world culture, not just Western culture. We made an effort to have a cast that was diverse, um, both uh, in terms of on you know, the characters you were seeing on the screen, but also uh, the voice actors who were portraying those characters. So that was stuff that was important to me even back then. And then our last question, what, is, what do you want to say to our audience? Um, 30 years, Gargoyles, I know you said it was your baby, but what do you, what do you want to leave us with about Gargoyles? Uh, <laughs> well, selfishly, I'd say buy the comic books that I'm writing Gargoyles comic books now, but I don't think that's what you're looking for. Um, I, what I would say is, is that um, the shows on Disney Plus I, you know, it's set in the 90s, and on some level it is very much a show of 94, 95, 96. But on other levels, I do think it's fairly timeless. I think, you know, if you ignore the fact that Xanatos' cell phone is the size of a brick, um, most of what is in that show still plays for a modern audience, still works today. And if you haven't seen it, check it out. I think it's worth viewing and if you have seen it you might want to watch it again pick up the comics because we're still doing fun things with the property and um, and the characters are just characters you fall in love with even the villains you know there's there's not a more charming guy on television than David Xanatos uh, or a character with more pathos than Demona uh, and then Goliath is one of the greatest heroes ever so um, uh, I would and the Goliath Elisa love story is one of the greatest love stories ever. So uh, I think, uh, I know I'm biased because I created it and I worked on it all and everything like that. But despite that bias, I still urge you to take a look or to check it out again because I think it's worth seeing. And I remember those brick phones, by the way. They, they were a real thing. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for your you. time. I appreciate it. You Hopefully too. I get to see you in Comic-Con. Are you guys going this year? I don't know. Uh, not so I, 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 I,